Hello, and welcome to episode 4F02, Treehouse of Horror 7, original air date, October 27th, 1996, right before the big election, which we'll talk about. I'm Josh Weinstein, executive producer, showrunner. This is Matt Granning, creator of Maggie. This is David Cohen. I wrote the Citizen Kang segment. Mike Anderson, I'm the director. Uh, Dan Graney, I plagiarized Theodore Sturgeon's Microcosmic World for the Lisa Simpson segment. This is Dan Castellaneta, voice of Kang, or Kodos, I can't even remember. And this is Ken Keeler, I wrote the segment that we're watching now. And now one thing you'll notice, every year we're always like, we've got to have a big wraparound and spend hours writing it and then cut it out right before air date. And you'll notice this season, we were like, let's forget it. The wraparound is the part where Marge says, this is going to be scary and you should get your kids out of the room and... Right, what, and the warning we that we're supposed that to That was have. one of the first times that we said, forget it about stuff, like quality, like let's that, not bother. Yeah, then we kept saying it throughout many episodes, yeah. Hey, did you guys have to pay for fish heads? Because I actually, I remember recording it, just saying, hey, what if I hum fish heads? Was that used in the show? It is. He just yeah, didn't... I just hummed it. Yeah, fish heads, fish heads. I think it's very important to discuss legal matters in this commentary. <laughs> one of Bar- Barnes was upset, <laughs> but the other Barnes said it was okay. We want to give Dr. Demento a second bite at that apple. Was that the first group Halloween name for the writers? I think it was. We were all listed as one Halloween name there. This segment is based on Basket Case. I was not aware precisely what this segment was based on, I have to say. Although I have learned subsequently, and I don't know whether it's the first occurrence of this uh, theme, there is a very famous short story by Richard Matheson, I believe one of his first famous short story from about 1953, that is very similar to this. It's a child being kept in an attic. Um, oh, I've given it away. But uh, <laughs> I, do, I don't know what Basket Case is. Was that a popular film? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too I'm too nervous to watch horror movies, but as I understand, it's about a crazy, deformed baby, possibly a sibling that's kept in a in a basket, in like a picnic basket, and then people open a picnic basket and it attacks people. But I believe it was based on it's supposed to be like a deformed sibling, I think. One thing I noticed when I was reviewing this episode last night at five AM was that uh Every one of these three segments is extremely similar to a Futurama episode. So uh, my apologies for ripping everybody in the room off. Very similar. And and apologies also to the people we ripped off for these stories. Yes. (laughs) You went into the attic? I'm very disappointed and terrified. I like how this is directed where you don't really see the twin, but you see that flash of movement. It actually it's pretty scary when you do watch it late at night. Yeah, this is actually one of the creepier segments. This is really well staged. Yes, Doctor. Were you referring to any movies when you staged this? I love horror films. I, I'm familiar with Basket Case, although it doesn't relate to this except it, Basket Case was an evil Siamese twin who was separated and kept in a basket. Um, but otherwise, there's no, no similarity. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. So I have two brothers? Lisa, please. Yes, Bart, you have a twin brother. You see, when you were born, there was an irregularity. A monstrous irregularity. Ah! Ah. Yes, I remember Bart's birth well. You don't forget a thing like Siamese twins. I believe they prefer to be called conjoined twins. And hillbillies prefer to be called sons of the soil. But it ain't going to happen. Now, normally... That line, and actually when I was reviewing it last night at 10 in the evening, it occurred to me, that line people have told me was sort of characteristic of me. They felt they could identify me in it. I don't see that at all myself. But it did strike me, having heard that as I was watching the rest of this episode, the large chunks of it seem like things that, to me that I could pick out as being the work of other of the writers whose, whose work, in fact, they were. I don't know whether people... I don't. We have a lot of writers here. Dan, David, do you guys feel like you have characteristic things that other people can pick out? Uh, what? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what... Uh, yes. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Your good well, friends have some sense of your own voice, and they sometimes hear it. They're, they're wrong, but yes, like people say that sounds like your line, and it's right a non-random amount of times. They're sometimes wrong, but it's far m- right more often than they should be. There's something. One thing I think related to what you're saying is that we Simpsons writers all have a guilty conscience because 
We're often complimented for our episodes or segments of episodes and often for specific lines in them. And it's such a collaborative process that we find ourselves taking well, no, compliments you things we guys know all we have guilty really consciences. Do <laughs> hmm? you, should have, you all have guilty consciences. I don't. <laughs> as the contributor of every as, one as of the those one who's lines that no one else wrote. But it is like a lot of the best lines in any episode were not actually written by the credited writer. I'm trying to remember which of the Simpsons writers it was who said just his advice was always take credit for it. If someone comes up, there's no reason not to. It's, it's not going to make reasonable. them feel better you to figure be told, it, no, it wasn't me. It balances yeah. out in the long run. It moment. does. It hurts people's heads even to think that people are writing it as opposed to just the actors saying it spontaneously when we record it. I especially like taking That's a writing great credit for a of great the character. improvisation by the cast. You made him kind of sympathetic and monstrous at the same time. That seems very Ken Keeler. <laughs> uh, no. In fact, I fought it tooth and nail. Really? <laughs> no, but it, I, it was, that was the rewrite. But you didn't like it? I was not that fond of it, but I know it's very popular. So. It's, I, it's okay. <laughs> I like that it does, does not work at all. <laughs> this is everyone's favorite moment to do yeah, this my, Yes, I the love animators this. love this joke. <laughs> it's all it's so shocking he's a nice doctor <laughs> that's again the lesson for us writers that the biggest laugh is usually the thing that has no words involved that's right it's someone falling on their head or getting hit in the head or some sort of violent action I had this theory that wait a minute Hugo's scar is on the wrong side Dan Green is motioning like he's about to say something did, very did we important. miss the line where he said too much of a too too crazy for, for oh, yeah, too, Boys Town? Too, too much, much of a boy, boy for, for crazy too, town? too crazy for Boys Town, too much of a boy for crazy we miss, That's one of my favorite lines in the whole history of the show. And that line is Josh's. Is it? Yeah, yes. I love it. And it stands out to me as being Josh's. I've heard effect. people use the phrase crazy town uh, just in speech now to describe when, you know, things, when people are doing irrational things. They... I don't know if I invented crazy but I also, town. But I'll I also take like, credit for it. But I also like that. They don't want people that are too boyish there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. it, they're very sensitive to children in Crazy Town. Hey, can I have some turkey? Oh, you finish your fish heads, then we'll talk. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> All right, so Dan, you want to talk about the origin of this? I think I was told to write this. Uh, so, uh, pro- by David Cohen? I pitched. I'm the one who pitched stealing this idea. <laughs> hey, Elise, check out my science project. One thing I like about this episode is that South Park later did an episode called The Simpsons Already Did It, and it had they re-ripped off this story from us, and, and they did our, this story again, but they also pointed out that we'd stolen it in the first place, so it was completely fair. And one of our favorite Futurama episodes, I would say, Matt and mine, uh, Bender has the little people living on his stomach. Oh boy, mold! That's sounds- actually in South Park. They tried to do something Simpsons didn't do, and then they finally came up with a story. But it turned out to be this one. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh. I like that it had one X on the microscope. That I believe was my joke. Let's oh, go. was it? I was about to say I thought it was my joke, but if it wasn't mine, I, it I was, don't have a clear it was memory. David Cohen, you know, if if it was mine, I was doing a David Cohen joke, <laughs> and if vice versa. Was- <laughs> I'm willing, let's just let's agree to share that. It could have been yours. It probably was. Hey, these aren't waffles. Now, I like this this whole discussion about waffles that was just come up with to get her out of the room. (laughs) And it seems like we didn't probably have to do that, but it's fun. So, how are my little Stone Age tub dwellers? Oh, my gosh. They're evolving so quickly. Speaking of lines which are identifiable as somebody's work, there's one coming up a little later in this that I'll point out that is I saw last night and I thought that is a Josh Weinstein line but we'll we'll test it to okay, see if I was right see. when it comes my recollection though I wouldn't call it characteristic is that I've invent I've created Lutherans is a Dan Graney line it sounds like you I love the cathedral yeah now these are great designs Mike and this whole again like when we do a whole different world there's a huge amount of yeah I think there's a line not in here that I've missed for many years the boiling zone no it was uh, with the owner of the blue sphere with the out-of-tub plates, please come to your octuple party. <laughs> out-of-tub plates. <laughs> as soon as you say that, I, I think, like, oh, yeah, that's in this episode. So we must have talked about it a lot. At the time. I, I believe it was, it was one of Ken, uh, Ken Line. Yeah. 
This is visually, I think, one of a very exciting Simpsons moment. This yeah. whole and thing. extremely <laughs> disturbing. The animatic right. was done at yeah. from four to seven in the morning <laughs> on the day of this, the animatic. And here's really? the first use of computers right here. Wow. It was just for reference, so we had to redraw it. First use of computers in the whole Simpsons? Uh, probably not, but I take credit for it. What happened? Uh, we just had them build some models, and we used it to, to track the move, and then we went in and retraced it for 2D. Wow, it's cool. And also, the sound is great. If you don't listen to commentaries, turn up the sound for a second, and it's awesome jet sound. Well, you practically destroyed their whole world. You can't protect them every second. Sooner or later, you'll let your guard down, and then flush. It's toilet time for Tiny Town. Here comes Metropolis. Oh, is this Metropolis? Well, the rings. The rings Metropolis around, uh... re reference from the old silent film. Oh, cool. Is that how they transport people to Metropolis or something? No, it's just how the robot comes, gets her life. Whenever you hear a word like debigulator, an invented word, you can bet with 99 and 9 tenths percent certainty that it was David Cohen. That's not no. true at all. What? <laughs> that is a lie. Uh, the debigulator was my word. The rebigulator was David Cohen's <laughs> ripoff of my word. Just Aren't, as which came first? As embiggen was my word, no. and then cromulent with no, David in, Cohen's pylon. That's true. I, that's true. <laughs> yes. Are you sure? I do. I'm one hundred percent sure. I'm a piler honor with when it comes to. Fake I'm words. astonished by this. I would have called David Cohen the king of the neologism, but no, <laughs> he's the he's the pretender to the throne. <laughs> Did we talk about that on another commentary? We did. Cromulent has made it onto dictionary.com. Yeah. That's right. Cromulent is the bane of my existence because uh, I Googled in Bigot and there were 5,000 hits. I was pretty psyched. Or 15,000. And I Googled Cromulent and there were 10 times as many. <laughs> Embiggen is a better word because it's it's the problem with it is I think I, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I'm sure. It's so good that it just people think it's a real word. I just want to interject there the, the, the guy from the Clark building. Uh, when I watch these at 10 years later, all I can remember are large things that got cut out. And we had this wonderful discussion about living in the Clark building and how terrible it was. Even though we never had the slightest clue. I mean, what is the Clark building? Okay, the guy who lived in the Clark building, that was the line I was thinking of. Was that you, Josh? Joe, whatever the guy's name is, he's John Smith, I live in the Clark building. The guy, who's the reporter who stood it's up there. It's that line? Yeah. It's, it may either be me or Bill who like very boring names for things. Like, <laughs> That now, was that was the line I was waiting now, for. Now, wasn't there by. was this the episode where this whole you boiling know, zone could have been him. The boiling zone discussion was in this episode. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. But where else would it have been? It must have been in this episode. There's a whole long run about also being banished in a boiling zone yes. or something. It's not there anymore. Give me the gift certificate. Oh, great! I'm stuck in this lousy tub for the rest of my life. Shouldn't you people be groveling? This, as I recall, was a grainy-esque ending. At the time. To me, that feels like George. I'm pretty certain it's David Cohen. <laughs> Let's give David Cohen. I don't think it's Cohen-esque. Well, here, this thing is Cohen-esque, and this is fabulous. I, I don't know if this episode was my idea or if I just wrote it. Does anyone remember? I mean, obviously, this was inspired by the fact that the uh, 1996 presidential election, we realized, would just be, I think, two days after the airing of this Halloween episode. And it was Clinton running against right. Bob, Bill and Clinton. And in fact, I remember there's, we actually had this is one of some people on the internet. I'll say hello to the people from No Homers Club asked a specific question about how did we figure this out? How did we plan it? How did we account for who would win? And I have a further question is why didn't Kay and Codus just wait till the election was solved and then just impersonate whoever that was? They didn't know, I guess. Uh, they didn't want to come back <laughs> later. <laughs> was that underwater shot, by the way? Was that a reference to something? Nope. It's just really <laughs> it's a cool. dynamic shot. Now, this episode violates kind of every rule of The Simpsons, but it's a Halloween episode, so maybe that's okay. Matt can pass judgment. But it's it's so fixed at a certain time, which is kind of a general taboo on The Simpsons. By, by naming the specific candidates of that 1996 election, this is forever said in one time. It's not as universally... But it's know, delightfully dated. I don't think episodes. I think any other combination of candidates wouldn't be as fun we can't rule out the possibility that clinton and dole will run against each other again it might be what's his name i love the line we've reached the limits of what anal probing can teach us that's one of my all-time favorite is that lines. Is, is that you or is it a steve Tompkins line? well here's i i can tell you i don't know who the line was but i can tell you it, i looked over the original outline so i what i had written was just um 
Homer saying, uh, might as well get it over with, and he starts to unbutton his pants. And then I had tried to just get a, get off the subject. <laughs> so somebody else added, pitch, must have pitched that. I think George probing. did. I think I, I recall George pitching that line. So I was there up to the pants part. There's a lot of nudity in this, ep- in this segment. Yes, and I'm going to point out something specific about it that I, I'm going to demand an explanation. Oh, about, is it the, is it the, the backward shot versus the forward shot? Yes, and that's why it. Is, yes. You'll keep an eye out. You notice these bands around the tube. They perfectly block the mid rift portion of the body, however you want to describe it, the groin area from the front. But from the back, the buttocks is completely visible. <laughs> so, I want to know how that's possible. Now, curiously, they morph, their heads morph into these shapes, and yet at the end, the masks are ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> That's how a bioduplicator works. I don't see the problem. We'll have to dispose of you. No, no, what are you spraying me with? Rum. <laughs> oh, I was well edited, Josh. I like how he comes in with rum so excitedly and quickly. Ket Brockman here with Campaign 96. America flips a coin. At an appearance this morning, President Clinton made... I love this, where Homer Homer's going to run in and tell that he was abducted by a UFO, but first he's going to lie about a fish he caught. <laughs> <laughs> As overlord, all will kneel trembling before me and obey my brutal commands. End communication. What the smooth talk. March, march. There I was. I had just caught the largest fish you'd ever seen when I was abducted by a flying saucer. Sure you were, Rummy. <gasps> That's one of the creatures. Senator Dole, why should people vote for you instead of President I like how his eyes face in different directions. I think that was an accident. (laughs) Now, I would say even though it's specific candidates, the message is timeless about politics and candidates. Yeah, one thing I think I've noticed about comedy shows that take on elections is the point is always the same. The point is it does not matter which of the awful candidates you vote for. Which was also a South Park episode, by the way. Which is a complete falsity. I mean, the idiot criminal that we have in office is not... <laughs> it's a lot worse I'm not than... saying it's a good point. I'm just saying it seems to always be the point. Abortions for some, miniature American flag... Because it, it feels like it's uh, a comment. Well, in, right, you're <laughs> able to just feel like you're making a commentary without actually yeah. taking sides and alienating people. Yeah, but and that when you have somebody who's clearly an aggressor, than saying even-handedness is actually favoring the aggressor. That's true. Confused. By the way, you and your opponent are, well, constantly holding hands. We are merely exchanging long protein strings. If you can think of a simpler way, I'd like to hear it. That was a sign. That sign must have taken a long time. And it's, it's, it ends up having five characters in it. That's The joke is five characters long. I like he had to pay $5 to listen to the debate. Upward, not forward, and always twirling, twirling, twirling. Now, this is very good twirling, by the way. Yes. Nice. That's some good twirling. And that, that must be 3D computer animation. So, uh, <laughs> copied it from Futurama. Now, I luckily had Homer run in before Dole had to give his speech, so we didn't have to write Dole's funny speech. You heard me. They're alien replicants from beyond the moon. <laughs> yeah, all right, pal. <laughs> Don't forget your stinking flag. Oh, why won't anyone believe my crazy story? Oh, that was fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> there was debate at the time about this because some people got all cranky and it was like, how does he happen upon it? And then after a few hours, we just... In a Halloween episode, there's no time to deal with the, that kind of degree of logic. And in a Halloween episode, nobody cares. I want to serve out my term naked in a tube. I am so mad at the Secret Service. Homer's uh, helping them escape is... Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay, the waist is the lowered waist. See, but obviously the top, the exposed part of their frontal midriff would be visible. You know, Senator, being in suspense, I'm hearing no comment. I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> cover the front. Continuity problem. Yeah, we better fix these on. Can we fix these people? <laughs> it's the bioduplication is they made their butts too high. Who's doing Clinton here? Phil That's Hartman. Phil Hartman. Phil Hartman, okay. Time to tear those aliens a third. Here's my personal favorite moment. Yes. 
Homer. <laughs> this is one of my favorite moments of all time because it's Just so the animation shocking is... and horrible. <laughs> And it's perfect animation how they suddenly just die and float away. <laughs> I really felt, I felt kind of bad about that at, at the time because they were real people, and I felt like, oh, maybe we should just have them abducted and brought away to the other planet or something. But there was too much laughter at that. <laughs> thing laughter about. always wins. Here for the sci-fi nerds, this is from Ray Harryhausen's Earth vs. Flying Saucers. watching this 10 years later, I thought he was about to see, say Senator Kerry. My yes. mind made me think he was going to say, say Senator, Senator Kennedy. <laughs> I felt the same way because Kerry ran in 2004 election. He says Senator K, and he was Senator Kerry. Yeah, the meaning has has possibly changed when people see it now. Now, that's a reference, of course, to Earth versus the Flying Saucers, right? Right, right. Which is interesting because he was going to say Kang or Kodos, but we don't know which one. And he didn't use the right vowel sound. Anyway, there was the masks. My fiance Patricia DeFrank, said that that might have been a reference to these old uh, Earth versus Mars cards, also from the fifties or something. Mm-hmm. Mars attacks. Mars attacks. I'm sorry. Shouldn't the bioduplicator be called the costume machine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can tell when an episode hits universal notes because my mother really liked this. Now that was for you kids or anybody else. That was Ross Perot, who was a third-party candidate. And may have swayed the election by taking a lot of votes from Dole. I remember when we first watched this in color when he whips Marge, you went, that's so gratuitous. (laughs) I know, because he should be whipping Homer. (laughs) It's very good. Don't blame me. I voted for Kodo. Now, there's a band, a rock band called I Voted for Kodo. No, is there? no way. It's named after this episode, so no, if they're listening, co- wow. send It's probably a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, also credit for a, a line I love when he says, this is my sister, Kodos. That was George Meyer. I'm almost positive who pitched That's that. one of my favorite lines. That's too. good. Did Boy, these spend funny names get Halloween funnier, name? don't they? Does anybody remember really agonizing over it? Once we came up with ours one year, we just kept doing it. Dan Castaneda, you just used your name backwards in your credit on and this I said one, right? say three times, backwards. Like Mr. Mitzel Pitalik or whatever. Uh-huh. 